Hi, everybody, and welcome. We're so glad you guys could be a part of this conversation today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Megan Davis. I've been at the Law Center as a professor since 2018, so a few years now, and my primary job task is to work with students for preparing for the bar. So today, we're going to have a conversation about that. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ajay Ketkar, a former classmate of Professor Davis, uh, U of H Law Center class of 14, and I'm currently a practicing uh, litig uh, litigation attorney here in Houston. Awesome, thank you so much. So yes, I have the distinct privilege of saying that I am also a UH alum and the two of us had different experiences at UH. Um, but both of us went through the bar exam and that's what we're gonna talk about today. <laughs> um, and while I can safely say we both survived, we both have careers now, it is also something I could say was not the best time of our lives. Um, <laughs> I think almost every student who takes and prepares for the bar exam will tell you it was a miserable several months. And uh, if they tell you it was wonderful, they're probably lying to you uh, well, or have blissfully for, forgotten what they were doing. <laughs> for me, the bar was so nice, I took it twice. So that's there you go. So that's a great way of introducing the fact that um, you're willing to tell us a little bit about your experience, which was that you took it with the same time I did, July of 2014. Yeah. And then you ended up taking it again. So will you tell everybody a little bit about that? Sure. So it's like, you know, normal three years of law school, and then, you know, the week after you do all the pomp and circumstance of graduation and celebrating, then you're right down to preparing for the bar. And so my bar prep was mostly normal. There was nothing really irregular about it. Like I took a course, I took the course that I took, I didn't take Barbary. I took Themis, which I don't know if it's the same as when I took it years ago, but it, it was completely online. It was like self-study, self-paced. And um, I took that, but one of the things that sort of complicated it was I started as a part-time student and then I transitioned into the full-time program. So during the summer after graduating, I was still like taking like three or six credit hours, like two, one or two classes for three or six credit hours to like actually finish my, finish my degree. And for the first part of summer, um, I had recently like late in the spring semester, I'd gotten a job like clerking for a firm. And so I was working. I didn't want to like start working for a month and then say, peace out. I got to take the bar exam. So I thought I'll keep working at least until like the mid midsummer to like show them how dedicated I am. And so um, while everybody was normally, you know, my classmates were all in the library, all they did was study for the bar. I still had some classes. I had my job and I was studying for the bar. So, you know, I took the bar and then, you know, come results time. So I don't know. I know the bar has gone through a lot of changes in the last few years. I don't know if it's this, how, how much is different, but at that time, the bar was scored out of a thousand points and you needed at least a 675 to pass. And, you know, I got a six, 637. So it was obviously disheartening because you didn't, I didn't pass, but it wasn't heartbreaking in the sense that I'm like, oh, I'm never going to be a lawyer. I just realized, oh, like, I came really close, I worked really hard, and maybe if I didn't have to juggle, you know, my last few classes, and I didn't have to, like, the go to work and, like, have the job, and ironically, the job that um, I was working, I didn't even have at the time bar results came out, like, I, I, was, I wasn't even there anymore at the time bar results came out, so that really didn't matter, so I, so I said, okay, yeah, this sucks, but it's not something that can't be overcome. And so from there, one of the good things um, that the bar does when you don't pass is they give you a, like a breakdown of how you did on each subject area, not just each area of the test, because when I took it, there was like the procedure and evidence day and then the you know MBE day and then the essay day. They don't just tell you how you did on those three days, but like they told you how you did in like, you know, real estate or criminal law or civ pro or, or whatever. And so you could see what your strong areas are. And I like, you know, breaking it down realistically, like trying to develop a game plan about how I'm going to do things differently the second time around. I just realized if I just increase my score, like 10% across the board, I don't need to, you know, shoot for the moon and try to get that perfect score. But if in like my weak areas, if I just increase my performance by 10%, which is a manageable number. It's like, it's, it's a realistic number that you're not sort of feeling defeated before you even start. I'm like, then I'll, then I'll get like this score, which is a passing score. So, um, and then luckily, you know, I, that after 
getting the bad news. I went back, re-registered for the test, studied. And, and this time when I studied, I still took Themis. I still did the, the course, but I didn't have, like, I didn't have classes, obviously. I had already gotten my degree and I didn't have a job. Um, so I could really dedicate, you know, like seven weeks of just dedicated studying um, where I did nothing. Um, I had no commitments. I, should, I wouldn't say I did nothing, but I had, I had no other commitments other than, you know, studying for the bar. And, you know, lo and behold, my plan um, kind of worked. It's like, you know, I think I said, well, if I improve 10% across the board, that'll get me like, you know, uh, 700 or something. And then like, you know, my final score was like 710 or something. So I'm like, I don't need to get, it's not like you're in law school and you need to get the A, you just need to pass. And so um, following my plan that I established for myself, I'm like, okay, it worked to a T. I got literally like within two points of where I thought I should be based on increasing my score 10% across the board. So yeah, and you're right. The bar exam has changed a little bit. Um, mainly big changes for those of you listening is that we've gotten rid of the procedure and evidence section. And now we have, but we maintain the MBE, we maintain the essays and we maintain the MPTs. In fact, we now have two MPTs. Um, oh yeah, forgot about that. And, <laughs> and the score section has changed to a scale of 400 and the passing okay. is now a 270. But we have students every year who come in very close and they're like, oh, I got a 265 or, oh, I got a 268. And that's just a gut, it's a gut check. Um, how did you handle the news the first night when you got the score? So I handled it in a way that I thought was normal, but a lot of people were like surprised. So of course, like, you know, you get the news and like, yeah, it, you know, the initial impact was like, well, you sort of, you're questioning everything. Like you're like, do, do I really belong in this industry? Do I, should I really be an attorney? It's like everything that you were certain of for like the last three years or relatively certain of for the last three years just like goes out the window and you're doing all this questioning and then but you see like you're still on social media so you see all your friends like they're passing and they're congratulating each other and you know just my my general outlook on life was if I want my friends to be there for me I'm going to be there for them even if I'm not in a place where I you know want to celebrate obviously I didn't want to celebrate anything but I did want to celebrate my friends with and so even that night, like when everyone's like, you know, organizing like some meetup at like a bar or something, I showed up and like, you know, I mean, people know, like you're, you're checking your friends to see whether your friends pass. So people know that you didn't pass. And as some people know, the, the amount of people that knows that you didn't pass grows. And so you show up and people are like, you know, oh my God, like, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, yeah, I, I appreciate their, their well wish. I would have otherwise. Like so many people reached out, said, hey, I know you're going to take it again. Like if you need this, you need that, like whether it's like actual study materials or just, you know, emotional support or whatever, I'm here for you. And so that was very comforting to realize it's not the end of the world. In fact, you learn a lot about your, your friends when something like this happens. Absolutely. And I think you bring up a really good point, which is having a support system, like having friends, having family. Some of us are lucky to have both. Some of us only have one or the other. Regardless, just having that group there for you during this time is so important because it is an emotionally exhausting time and it's intellectually exhausting. And it right. is, as you said, months and weeks of just, it is consuming. And so being able to have someone there to just vent to, or to say, I don't understand this question, or I know you did really well in this class and I didn't even take this class. Can you help me through this concept? It can be so critical to success. Um, and I would encourage everybody to try to have a support system as you're going through this and as you receive results to either commiserate or celebrate, but you'll be there together. And I think you're absolutely right. I think um, as one of your peers, I will say everybody really respected you for um, taking it in the chin and then coming out to be there for the rest of us. Um, and we applaud you for that. And I think everybody looks back on that positively. I, I'm going to be one of the ones to say there's no judgment. <laughs> so if somebody's sitting there listening to this saying, oh, what do you do? How do you tell people? One, it's really not a point of conversation. Um, right. I know, which is why I'm picking on him for this conversation, but it's not something that I walk in when we see each other out in Houston and I go, hey, have you recovered from bailing the bar yet? <laughs> um, it's just not, it's not something that even comes to mind. If it wasn't for the fact that I work with students preparing for the bar, I don't think I would ever have thought to have this conversation at all. So don't feel that this leaves you um, with a scarlet letter or right. you're going to be some fringe member of the legal community. I think it is something that happens to really successful attorneys. So on that note, 
you've kind of taken a few twists and turns to get to your place in the law right now. And you worked in bigger firms and smaller firms. And can you tell everybody, did it create, like, did you have trouble finding a job? Did you find a job at all? Are you even a lawyer now? <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me check the state bar website. Yep. Still. still <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I definitely, I, I learned that, you know, people say, oh, I haven't, like I had a non-traditional like path once I became a lawyer. Right. And I think the, the, the non-traditional path really is the traditional path. Like, I think everybody has this idea that, oh, you go to law school and then we're, obviously if you do really well or you get the opportunity to go work for a big firm or you go work for like, you know, a small firm or wherever and you're there for a few, like, you know, five, six years and then you make partner. And if, oh, if you don't make partner, then you're there indefinitely until you can, you know, go in-house or like, there's this like weird cliche trajectory that people just assume that lawyers have. And I mean, I'm sure it's, it still exists because I mean, now I think we're reaching a stage in our careers where our classmates that, that we graduated with are now, you know, making moves or like becoming partners at their respective firms or they're going in like, you know, high level in-house positions at, at private companies. And so there's not really a traditional path anymore. Even like, you know, I, I, like I said, even the, the what was considered non-traditional is now actually the traditional path where it's very long and winding and not no, like terrain is unknown. So I always wanted to be um, a litigator. I just didn't know what area of law that I wanted to do. So I've worked in commercial litigation. I've worked in employment law. I've worked in, I mean, now for the last like four or five years, I've been in personal injury, which is sort of where I knew I wanted to land up. But I've never worked at a big firm, um, never made the, that sort of big firm money that that's famous um, that you see all during holiday season when they're talking about bonuses. I'm like, where the hell is that coming from? Um, but I've had the, the, the benefit of that is I've seen law firm management at multiple stages. I've seen how a law firm is managed when you have a hundred or more employees. I've seen how a law firm is managed when you have five or less employees. And so given that, you know, my own career goals involve like, you know, having my own firm, I've seen, having seen law firm management, the good and the bad at each size. I have a really good idea about like what works and what doesn't work from you know the the corporate you know human resources management organizational structure management standpoint. So I don't think I would have had that exposure and experience if I stayed at a single firm, regardless of size, for the last few years of my career. Does that make any sense? Um, internally, yeah, because internally, yes, because. Literally, the, the first job I had after passing the bar, you know, I, I'm, I'm interviewing for, and they're just like, well, it says here you got licensed in X date, but you graduated, you know, what happened? Why did, why didn't you, like, what happened with the bar exam? And I'm like, well, I didn't pass. And so they're just like, well, the, you know, that, that was sort of an, obviously a negative indicator where it's like, oh, you didn't pass the bar exam. And I said, um, well, I, I eventually did. And so the, the same body, like the same government, I, I was sort of snarky about it. I said the same governing body that allows you to practice law has told me I can practice law. So I don't really see the difference. Like, I don't see why this matters. And, you know, the employer actually liked like the attitude. And so, um, but yeah, it, it was, I never got any, other than that one instance, I never got any signs um, or messages from people saying like, oh, the reason I'm not getting a job or the reason I'm not being considered for something is because of my, of the fact that I didn't pass once, if anything, it was more in my own head and like, you know, this, a symptom of imposter syndrome where you're just like, oh, I didn't pass the bar the first time. Why would they want me? And so you don't, you either don't apply or you don't, if you do apply, you don't like give it your best effort. So it was more mental in, in my own head about the effect of not passing the bar than anything I ever heard from a prospective employer. You mean nobody asked you at a networking event? How many times did it take to pass the bar? I think people have no. a it's misconception. <laughs> you know, there's, there's an old quote where it's like, you'd stop caring what people think about you as much if you realize how little they actually do. And so it's like, no one, no one follows, like I certainly don't follow people about their personal or professional accomplishments and then 
bring up their failings at, you know, some social event. So, I mean, there are people that do that are just, you know, they need better hobbies, I guess. But well, yeah, and also, no I don't think anybody, it just doesn't even come to me when I meet an attorney to be like, hey, so tell me about your bar exam experience. Yeah. Um, it's just, I don't think it's ever a point of conversation. And I think people fear when we meet each other and when we see each other and when we're at networking events, they say things like, graduated from law school in 2014, licensed in 2015. That doesn't even, it just, it doesn't come up. No, um, it doesn't. And so I don't think people need to stress that part. So thinking back to when you were preparing the first time, you had a lot of things on your plate. You're balancing work. You were balancing classwork. You were doing Themis. It was online. That's an experience a lot of students are having right now is a lot of things are online in a pandemic world. Right. Um, when you changed to, you kept with the same plan for the second round. Uh -huh. And a lot of the bar prep programs right now are still online. Did you feel that you had to change your mentality about approaching the bar prep process? Not just to say, I can do this and I need to clear out my other responsibilities, but the studying itself. Did you think you had to do anything differently? Yes. And, and because I, I, I think this is the, my initial way I studied using Themis is like Themis, um, you know, it'll, you'll watch videos and literally you follow along with the video and the, the way they help you follow along is they have like a work basically like a fill in the blank worksheet for each video and then like you're supposed to watch the video fill in the blanks right and that's true for most bar providers yes oh okay okay it's still the same and so I thought like oh I'll just watch the videos fill in the blanks and then um you know do the practice question sets that they have for you and then, you know, same thing with the essays, like do the practice essays. And like, it was sort of like, I was just doing it for the sake of doing it to like fulfill the requirements of the course. So I could like check the box that, oh, I watched that video. Oh, I did that problem set. And I didn't actually study. And so you have to keep in mind that these, whether it's Barbary or Kaplan or Themis or whatever other company is out there, um, it's, a, it's, it's a tool to assist you with studying. It is not doing the course and only the, the requirements of the course um, is not in and of itself studying. And that's what you have to keep in mind. So I realized, yeah, well, just watching the videos and fulfilling out, filling out like a worksheet, what clearly didn't do it. Like, obviously I did that and it didn't work. So I did lots of like classic studying techniques, like, you know, the whole space repetition where it's like, I made flashcards with, you know, terms and definitions, and, um, you know, eventually like I, I would make like 50 flashcards a day. And then every day uh, as my, you know, as the, the, in the box of flashcards grew and grew and grew, I would, you know, just pull out 50 and quiz myself. So it could be any, like, I didn't separate it out by subject matter. So I could get a crim law question followed by a real estate question, followed by a crim law question, followed by like, a, you know, real estate question, I don't know. Um, or a contracts question. So um, it's so it sort of mimicked like what the experience was of an MBE where you're going to get any, I mean, it's multiple choice, obviously, but when you're in, when you're focused on contract law, like all the ideas in contract law are sort of, they mesh together, but then all of a sudden now you're thrown, you know, um, a criminal law question. So you have to get out of contracts and into the criminal, like criminal law mentality. So it helped having those flashcards helped like, have my brain like move quickly from one subject to another and get used to that process. So um, I'm not having to deal with the mental strength it takes to make that shift during the test. Like I've, I've trained for it. I'm not doing it for the first time. Yeah. Um, I think that brings up three huge things, which is one, you had to take, you had to take extra steps that the yeah. program itself is usually a minimum threshold for success. Um, you really have to take extra steps, do extra things, Second, practice is so important. Um, and it sounds like you really increased the amount of ways you were practicing, not just doing the practice through the program, but also creating your own practice and simulating as much of that experience as possible in advance of the exam itself. And then, um, like I said, you don't need a perfect score. You're not shooting for an A, you're shooting for a passing grade. And it, it, it saves you a lot of time if you can, focus on the areas that are going to be tested the most, which you know, based on prior history. 
Well, and even more so now because of the change to the UBE, the MBE topics or essay topics. So there's 65 to 70% of the exam material. So starting with those and really beefing up your practice and that material could be huge in terms of feeling confident walking in that day and knowing you kind of gamed the system and know that core material. Um, when you look back, is there, you said flashcards, is, did you do a lot of the essay practice as well in MPTs or do you remember those? Have you blocked them out as a... I do remember, <laughs> I don't remember the MPT as much. I mean, I literally forgot that was a thing until you mentioned it at the beginning of our conversation. Um, but I do remember for essays, what I would do is I would literally practice like memorizing like rule statements. Cause it's like, obviously like, you know, it's, it's not like the essay questions are really not that different than what you did as a law student taking like your first year um, law exams where it's like, here's a big fact pattern and you have to, you know, apply, apply the law but you have to know the law um, in order to apply it. So I would, practice typing out like rule statements, like making them as succinct as possible, because I knew I'm going to have to do that. Like, you know, um, you know, if I, if I have to uh, like write the rule about what's a valid contract requires, you know, what two elements, right? So I would memorize rule statements because you're, I mean, it's, it's, you're going to know the law at a certain point, you're going to know like what a contract requires, but I had a tendency to be very verbose. And so you know, time, time is always a factor um, in the bar exam. And so I would literally like hand, and I just, I studied a little bit of like how memory works and how to best retain concepts. And for me, I know that if I handwrite stuff, um, I will remember it better than if I type it out. And so I would literally grab a legal pad and say, okay, I'm going to memorize rule statements. So I don't have to worry about how I'm going to phrase a legal rule or phrase black letter law when I'm actually going through the essays. Like, I'm like, I want to get to the meat. I want to get to applying the facts to the situation. I don't have to worry about, am I phrasing this legal rule correctly? So I, cause I've already memorized yeah. it. Absolutely. And I think it's still true. I mean, I have a lot of students who say, oh, I know the rules, I'm familiar with them. But when it comes time to regurgitate them, there's that hesitation and there's, you're right, some get so long-winded and they're not able to get it on paper quickly so they can move into that application section. And you're absolutely right, there's merit to that. But there's also a know thyself moment. You know, you just said it's better for you to handwrite, which science supports that. But also it's knowing you did really well with flashcards. Somebody I'm sure who's listening to this video was like, ah, flashcards. But it's a know thyself and what works for you and how you best not just retain the material, but best can regurgitate the material. Because I think there's a passive studying that has become really popular in a Zoom um, world, which is where mm -hmm. we sit and we watch videos and we absorb kind of what you were saying you did the first round. You absorb, you listen, you write down one or two things. You're like, yeah, yeah, I'm studying. I'm doing all the good things. And then the second round, you became much more active in your studying. You were writing things and practicing those statements. And it's not, it became so much more active and the more active it is, the more you're able to perform and act in that manner at game time. And so I would encourage everybody who's listening to be very active in their studying and it may be making your own flashcards and going through them and saying, yes, I got that one, I got that one. Oh, need to do that one again, need to do that one again. <laughs> or it may be writing those rule statements over and over as you're listening to, you know, after you finish the videos, before you head into the essay practice and then doing the practice. It's because the students who I say, who they're like, I sat in front of the computer for 10 hours and I watched all the videos. How did my score not go up? The first thing I want to say is you're not tested on how well you watch. You're right. tested on how well you can regurgitate and perform and apply. And so, yeah, practicing those rule statements is step one of that performance part. Um, so it's absolutely critical you're able to do that. Yeah, because I, I mean, I can remember like, you know, when everybody is, uh, freaked out their first semester one all year and you're like you're taking practice exams like you're like trying to find copies of your professor's old exams and then like you're going to the library and like trying to simulate test conditions or exam conditions and it's like for some reason we like stop doing that <laughs> when we study for the bar because the it is psychologically daunting because you feel like there's so much that you have to do and there's so much to learn that you're like well if I do, I can't spend three hours doing that because that means that's three hours I don't get to spend doing something else, right? And in the end, you eventually you sort of half-ass both things, and it doesn't help doesn't help you. Um, one of the things that um, you know you touched upon having a good 
um, uh, structure around you in terms of people. Um, and so one of, you know, when I found out that I didn't pass, obviously there was other people that I knew that I was actually very good friends with that also didn't pass. And so when we, you know, it was, it was good to, it's always good to have, um, those people around you, like when you're studying for the bar exam, the summer after you graduate, like sort of everyone that you knew that you went to law school with, they're all, they're all doing this together. Like whether you're not actually studying together in the same place is, is one thing, but you, you know that everybody is going through what you're going through. But then when you don't pass and, you know, you're sort of like, well, now, now you feel like, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on this by myself. Like, yeah, you, you put up the friendly face, you know, you're not a, you know, a pariah, you're not ostracized. But then it feels like, oh, well, I got to do this, but this time I got to do it alone. I would say you don't like, you know, there's the statistics show you're not going to be the only one that didn't pass. So it benefits you to like seek out, even if you weren't very close to them or really friends with them, seek out other people from your class that that didn't pass and, you know, work together. And that's exactly what I did where um, for that, you know, December and January and, and February, um, I was at the law school um, with a friend. And so we were in a familiar place. So that felt good. We were in a, a familiar place that signified like study in academia, which was the law center, but we got to work together. So we get to, uh, one of like one of the things that I did this time, the second time around is we actually worked together. Like, we were in the same room, like studying, like uh, sitting across the desk from one another and we would bounce ideas off of each other. And like, we could obviously quiz each other using flashcards, using the problem sets. And, you know, he would explain things to me that I just didn't understand, you know, um, what is it, payment systems, right? Like that was the area, one of the areas where I'm just like, I do not understand it. There's like so much terminology that I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And, you know, he explained it to me very simply and in a way that I understood. And same thing for me, like he could not, um, my friend that I was studying with cannot understand or wrap his head around secured finance. And, or secure transactions, whatever they call it now. And I could explain it very well. And so you sort of, you, you complement each other, like you're, you're, you know, one person's strength can complement your weakness. And so, because, you know, the, the professor on the video on the theme is recording might not necessarily be the, you know, he's just following literally a script that he or she is following a script that theme has provided them. It's not like this professor that you're seeing on screen put together this course from his or her own materials. And so they're not necessarily the best person to explain the legal concepts you're supposed to be learning. Um, so that's the other benefit of working with someone, whether it's the second time around or the first time around. So it's not just having a person there to sort of vent and rely on for emotional support. It's, it's there to help you study as well. Because um, everybody has their different skill sets, you know. I, I can explain something in a way that maybe a professor can't that helps you understand something. And this, I got the same benefit from a friend that could explain something better that I didn't understand. Well, and I think you hit on several things that were really important. <laughs> One, you know, what, I have students asking me all the time, how do I know when I'm ready? And that's a hard, they're like, well, my scores, I don't know. How do I know when I'm ready? Well, ideally you're consistently getting four out of six on essays, four out of six on MPTs. You're getting at least 65% on MBE, but is that realistic for everybody? No. Does that mean you're going to fail? No. How do you know when you know the stuff? It's when you can teach it. It's when you can sit there and yeah. be conversational about it. So having someone to kind of, it could be your study buddy. For me at certain points, it was, I had an infant daughter that throughout law school, and then she was three when I was preparing for the bar, bless her heart. She got to hear all about contracts in the car and I'd be driving down the road going, okay, so we talked today about promissory estoppel and, you know, and I was having <laughs> to explain things in simple terms or um, my now ex-husband got to learn all about torts that summer. <laughs> so I would walk around the house telling him, I think what you're doing is negligent. Let me tell you why. Maybe that's why we're divorced now, but all those things happen. And it's a great way to say, if I can explain it and someone can understand it, then I've obviously mastered it or at least to a degree that right. I should be able to pass the exam. Yes. Um, having a study buddy is exactly what I did when I was studying for the bar. I had a friend who we set an eight o'clock start time and we would not stop until at least four. And then uh, she would go home and keep studying and I would go home and we kept going. But the big thing for us was having a structured day. And so like you're saying, you know, that person's going to be waiting for me. So I can't sleep in. I can't go and do other things. I can't get distracted by what's happening on the internet. It was a way to keep ourselves 
on task. And some days it was just, she was sitting next to me and we weren't really talking. And we were, she was doing a video and I was doing some practice essays. And then other days, yeah, we were sitting there working through questions and talking through concepts we, one of us didn't understand. And then there were other days where we were absolutely teaching each other, um, but it was a really great way to hold each other accountable. And I think honestly, in a world now more than ever that's online and distractions abound and we're all getting, it's the summer for most people who are gonna be taking the bar and it's pretty mm-hmm. outside and you're like, oh, it's just a day. If I just take a day. And then suddenly, or I just, I'm going to go to the pool for an hour and suddenly the hour turns into two or three, or you're on, you know, Instagram and you're like, it's just a 10 minute break. And suddenly the 10 minutes turns into 45. It's easy to get off task. And so having someone who will corral you and keep you to it is really helpful. Um, So I do encourage that. Yeah. Cause I I remember. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. Oh. Yeah, I remember. So, you, you, and like you said, you have to do it correctly. Like the way you describe it is like the correct way to do it. Because when I studied during the summer, I would be in the presence of my friends, but you know, we wouldn't necessarily be like keeping each other accountable because we're just like we just didn't want to be alone studying, right? Like we didn't want to like be like at home or like by ourselves, you know, in a coffee shop or wherever. You know, it just feels better to you know at least be in the presence of your friends, right? Um, that wasn't the same as when I was studying the second time around with my, with, with, you know, my friend where obviously like, you know, the stakes seem a little higher, right. Or it's like, oh, you know, oh crap, I didn't pass the first time that like, we really need to buckle down and we did keep each other accountable, but like just being in the presence of your friends, um, it needs to be a little bit, like you said, at least be a little bit more where it's like, you know, we kept each other accountable from the numerous distractions that exist. And, you know, speaking the structure, right. I think that's what I did definitely the second time around. I was more focused on saying, okay, um, from, you know, from, for me, it was like 10 to five and then took a break. And then it was like eight to eight to like 11 or something like in the evening. Um, Luckily, luckily I didn't have the the responsibilities that you did. So I was, um, I could, you know, be a little bit more flexible in terms of when I actually chose to focus, but um, you know, it's, it's really hard to see, like, you know, you go on social media during the summer and all your friends that are not, you know, law school friends or, um, you know, at the pool or at the beach or on some vacation. And so it's important for you to like, it's not, you're not wrong to say, okay, Sunday, um, I'm not going to study. Like you say, you, I'm yeah. planning to take this trip. You don't have to feel guilt if you plan it and you say, it, and you're very intentional about it, you don't have to feel guilty about, you um, not studying for a day during the during the summer during the time because I mean just psychologically like it's not sustainable for you to keep up like you know this insane very intense uh mentally intense intellectually intense schedule for six to eight weeks it's just not like physiologically um possible for or or if it is you still should do it because it's not effective um it's actually beneficial for you to say okay it doesn't have to be it doesn't I mean it doesn't have to be even a weekend it can just be like any day say on this day I'm not studying I'm going to do whatever it is I want to do whether whether it's um you know taking care of personal stuff or whether it's like um going on vacation or just relaxing take that time off because that break allows your mind to sort of de-stress and reprogram itself and unwind un- unwind itself so it's not just constantly stressed because it is a stressful process and you're, you're going to be mentally feeling like FOMO where it's like, oh, I'm missing out on um, this and that event and I wish I was at the pool. And so it's okay for you, like if you know like, oh, you know, friend's birthday party is this Saturday, um, you can go, like there's nothing wrong. Like you don't have to be like, you know, oh, I can't go, I have to study for the bar exam. It's like, no, go, enjoy yourself because, you know, it's just and on every level, it's good. It's good for you to unwind. It's good for you to relax. It's good to give your brain a break. And for you emotionally and socially, you need it. You know, you need enjoyment. So you don't have to feel guilty about it. Like obviously in, I wouldn't say even in moderation, like those days should be, you know, once a week or once every 10 days or so, but you still need it. And you shouldn't feel guilty about having planned days where you're just like, yep, not doing anything. Yeah, I think a lot of students start the bar exam process as a sprint, and it is such a marathon. And one thing you'll learn about a lot of marathon runners is they, one, build up to it, 
And then two, it's about pace and maintaining a pace. And there is a day-to-day -day sanity level. I have a lot of students who are like, I have to work out for my sanity, or I have to, you know, I have a significant other or I have other responsibilities. I'm not telling you to stop being a person. Oh, Build right. those things into your day. Like create a schedule where you say, I know I'm going to be at the gym by eight, out by nine, showered and, you know, working by 9.30. Great. Mm -hmm. Sleep, eat, you know, do those critical things. Um, sometimes you do have to sacrifice something else. Maybe instead of going to HEB for an hour on Sunday, you just have it delivered. Right. Um, so there's other things that can get cut to ensure you keep the things you value. And to keep the things that make you a human and give you sanity and like you're saying, give you rest. Um, and so look at when you're preparing for the bar exam, I tell students all the time, we advise to have about 600 hours of work and that's billable hours, which sounds crazy at first, except if you start spacing it out and really make it a structured schedule, there's absolutely time in the week to take time off and to mm -hmm. take a step away and step back. And the other thing is on a day-to-day -day basis, check yourself glazed over kind of, I don't know what I'm doing anymore, but I'm listening and I'm clicking and it feels like I'm studying isn't going to be helpful. So stop yourself, walk away, go do something that refreshes you, whether it's just walking around the block or playing with the dog or watching a 30 minute show or playing on Instagram or, you know, whatever that may be. And then come back to work again, because if you're sitting there glazed over, it's so ineffective and you're better off just taking a full break and coming back to it. Um, so much of this process is about maintaining your sanity, maintaining an awareness of yourself, um, of how you study, of how you keep yourself rejuvenated and are you know, energized to go forward and do another day of this. It's knowing you know, how you need to work with someone. Do you need that accountability partner? Are you really good by yourself? And you're like, I don't, what they're talking about with a partner, I don't need. It's, but you've got to know yourself. You've got to know when mm -hmm. being with your friends is really just kind of a distraction and an excuse to not work. So right. there's a lot of things here. I mean, you mentioned flashcards and I personally was an attack outline person. So I have to know that for me, it was mentally taking the rules and then rewriting them a little shorter and rewriting them a little shorter. It's very similar to your writing your rules statements. And I was getting them tighter and tighter. And in my mind, I could unfold that attack outline and see the bigger portion of my first outline. So there were things and tools that we each had to be aware of. I think flashcards would have worked for me. I just happened to be an attack outline person at the time and it worked. Yeah. Um, but know thyself is such a huge part of this process because I think there is a psychological component that we've been alluding to for a little bit, which is it gets kind of competitive for a minute. It's one L all over again in terms of how'd you do on that practice exam? Oh, I got <laughs> 78%. And you're like, but I only got 48 or I got 68 or what do you mean? And it may be they really got 78 and maybe they're blowing hot air and just don't want to admit that they only got 60. There's going to be <laughs> moments where... Um, it, it freaks you out again. And so you've got to have a sanity level and you've got to know what they're doing works for them, what works for you. So don't panic when the person next to you says, oh, well, I've been making flashcards for three days straight. And you're like, I hate flashcards. Do I, am I supposed to be making flashcards? Yep. Why am I not making flashcards? Um, so know what works for you and then really dig in deep to it. But I think there's themes to everything we're talking about that I want to make sure everybody's hearing, which is a support system. Um, it's huge. At the end, it's huge at the beginning and in the process. Um, practice is overwhelmingly important. Going above and beyond what your bar provider schedules, realize that is a minimum threshold. He's talking about yes. making flashcards. I made attack outlines. Both of us were seeking out people to help have conversations. That's not on the agenda that you get from Barbary or Themis or Helix or Kaplan. They don't budget for that. So you've got to recognize that's going to be extra input. Um, have the mentality that you don't have to get an A. You just need to pass but you're going to try your darndest to get there. Uh, and it will be worth it in the end, even if it takes you more than one lap. Uh, it'll be worth it in the end. I feel like I've seen and heard enough of your success on Facebook that I can, I know I'm old school, I still go on Facebook. Um, I mean, it's fine. <laughs> that I can say you've had a very successful career and where you are right now seems to be fulfilling for you and on the right track to making you um, a happy person and getting your own firm. Uh, and you'll have that experience in your belt to do that as a result of all the experiences you've had along the way. And part of that was getting through the bar exam. Um, yeah. I would tell them that take it seriously, but don't fear any potential consequences, good or bad. It's like that eventually, right? Training. It's just, you, we have this idea that this is the end of the world if you don't pass. And I'm sitting here telling you as someone that didn't pass. It's not the end of the world. In fact, if you, I'm not saying don't, I'm not, I'm definitely not saying don't pass and then take it the second time, <laughs> but 
it it definitely what 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 failing and then passing taught me is like it built a certain physical and emotional toughness in me to say that you know what I've felt what losing tastes like or I've tasted tasted losing and it's not that bad so nothing scares me anymore I'm not afraid to try things because I you know what's the worst that could happen I'm, I'm fine I just have to try again or do something else it's not that big a deal. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know I just took some billable hours from you, so oh, no, <laughs> I don't think I can afford your rate. I get 40% regardless of how, how long I spend. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. And I know our students will benefit from hearing your thoughts and experience. So thank you for sharing with everybody. And uh, folks who are listening, if you guys have any questions for me, I know I'm not your normal professor, but I will gladly meet with you. So don't hesitate to email me, mlwilso3 at central.uh.edu. And I would love to catch up with you guys and talk to you about the bar prep process. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me, Professor. <laughs>